This Week in Startups is brought to you by SendPro Online from Pitney Bowes. Save time and money no matter what you ship or mail. Try it free for 30 days and get a free 10-pound scale when you visit pb.com slash twist. LinkedIn Marketing. To redeem a free $100 LinkedIn ad credit and launch your first campaign, go to linkedin.com slash thisweekinstartups. And Vanta. Compliance and security shouldn't be a deal breaker for startups to win new business. Vanta makes it easy for companies to get a SOC 2 report fast. Twist listeners can get $1,000 off for a limited time at vanta.com slash twist. Hey everybody, it's This Week in Startups and I'm really excited about today's podcast because I've got two of the smartest people in podcasting. And one of them makes the greatest podcasting app, in my opinion. Uh, his name is Marco Arment, and he created the Overcast uh, podcasting app, which, which if you don't use or pay for, uh, and you're a power podcast user, uh, you, you don't know what you're missing. It's literally like every innovative feature that you see in every other podcasting app was in Overcast six months ago. It's basically the roadmap for every other app. Uh, welcome to the program for the first time, Marco Arment. How are you? Thank you very much. Nice to be here. And thanks for that amazingly awesome introduction. I hope I can live up to it. Well, I mean, I just, you know, when I look at a product, I think the thing that, you know, you look back on after investing in 200 companies, when, when you see great product, it's undeniable. And I know you worked on Tumblr as well. What was your role at Tumblr? I don't remember, but I know you did very well. Uh, and you and you had you were a major contributor to that, correct? Yeah, I was basically like David's employee the whole time, like as he was starting it. So I was the lead programmer. Uh, I was doing a lot of the back end stuff, a lot of the server stuff. And it was basically just me and David for a while. And then we eventually hired more people. Yeah. And, and that was another one of those transcendent products where you just looked at it and you're like, wow. The, the amount of craft and nuance in the product, and when I saw, uh, you know, and, and no offense to Spotify podcast, which is fine, or, I you know, Apple's podcasting app, it's great. There's a lot of great apps out there, but what's really, I think, unique about Overcast is you made it for power users. Correct me if I'm wrong, because you can make lists of your podcasts, you can put them into subgroups, you can change the speed of each podcast, you can do the speed based on each podcast so if you're listening to me or ben shapiro you wouldn't put it on more than one x but if you were listening to somebody who talks you know like sam harris you know sam harris needs a 1.6 and then you also have the smart speed button where it chops out the blank spots instead of audio doing that then you have the sleep timer which can end at the end of the podcast or 30 seconds i mean the feature list is just so brilliant tell me about the start of why you created overcast well, I mainly made it because like, I'm a nerd, I'm a podcast listener, I'm a programmer, and I wanted to do it my way, and because that's what nerds do. And yeah. so I made an app that was like my ideal podcast app. But also, I wanted to make a stake in the ground that at the time, the trend was already starting and Overcast has been running, it's been out since 2014. And the trend was already very clear then that there would be efforts to slowly lock down podcasting into walled gardens. Mm. And I wanted to really make sure that I could put a stake in the ground and make the podcast client ecosystem even more diverse than it already was to just make it harder. Because if the if the ecosystem is really diverse among a whole bunch of different apps that are all just using the open RSS-based ecosystem, then no app is going to have an easy time coming in there and locking that down. And so that's part of why I decided not only am I going to make my preferred app, but I'm going to make it try to have a wide appeal and make it free up front, which at the time, almost none of the other third party apps were free. Yeah. Um, but I make it free up front and figure out some other way to make money down the road, which I went through a bunch of stuff and eventually did. Um, and there's a pro version. And I think the pro yes. version lets you turn off ads if you that's want to. It. And yeah, I and the turn are, the ads back on, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> because I want to see who's advertising because I'm just curious. It's like an, it's a discovery thing. If people will pay, and we did some experimenting and paying for it for this podcast, and it was great. We got like some really targeted users. I was like, I want to actually see the ads because I'm curious who's investing in their podcast. Uh, also on the program today is Dan Granger, and he runs a, a firm called Oxford Road. Now, if you're a civilian podcast listener, you may not know what that is. Uh, but Dan uh, co-hosted This Week in Marketing, which was a podcast I started when I started a podcasting network in 2011 that I eventually shut down. 
just to focus on this one because I couldn't find enough great hosts and couldn't manage all these big personalities. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Dan. Explain to people what Oxford Road does. So we're an ad agency. I think the unique thing about us is we got in very early to the podcast space, uh, pre-serial. And uh, we've worked with some of the best brands. One of the things we were able to take advantage of was the renaissance that was happening in audio at the same time as the renaissance that was happening with D2C brands. So we were very early with companies like Dollar Shave Club, LegalZoom, you know, companies that, that now we all know, but at the time what they were doing seemed very novel. So um, mm. we were able to, to kind of ride both waves at the same time and build a business very fast. Um, that was able to serve both of those constituencies and to great effect. And so we've, you know, been able to expand. It's not just podcasts, but that is our signature dish. Um, and we're really an audio first agency. Okay. Um, and so I brought both of these gentlemen on the podcast, one from the standard side and the consumer consumption side, and one from the business side in terms of advertising to talk about the state of podcasting in 2020. Uh, as many of you know, I started this podcast, uh, under a different name, Calacanis Cast, 12 years ago, I think, and 11 years ago for this one, we've done over a 1000 episodes, but I think it's a good time to pause because there's been a lot of activity. I want to start with the big seismic event, uh, which Marco, you alluded to, which was, hey, this was built on open standards by a friend of ours, uh, Dave Weiner, who led RSS, a uh, really simple syndication, is that right? And mm -hmm. then he added an attachment the ability in your RSS feed to add an attachment. That was the key moment that enabled podcasting, correct, Marco? Yep. And ever since then, it's grown and nobody has been able to strangle it or control it. So just like the web, just like blogs, uh, which actually blogs has been kind of deprecated, we'll get into that, but the web and email and of course, podcasting have exploded all on this open standard. Marco, when you saw the announcement that Joe Rogan had had his show, I believe, licensed, not bought, for what looks like you know, 50, 100 million dollars for some number of years, I don't think all the details are out. You were like, F this, I think on Twitter was your quote. <laughs> <laughs> Explain why that is so problematic to you and to the industry. The main thing is that podcasting has has gotten to where it is and is as great and awesome as it is for all the reasons anybody who's ever heard of RSS should already be familiar with. You know, it's it's this wonderful open ecosystem with a wide variety of producers and consuming apps and this great ecosystem that isn't controlled by a single entity for the most part. You know, Apple's kind of an asterisk in certain ways, but for the most part, it's not really controlled by an individual entity. And you can compare it to something like YouTube, where if you want to make video that matters at all today, it has to be on YouTube, basically. Hmm. And so that you have this one company, this one platform controlling the by far like the majority of this really important medium. And you look at doing stuff on the web. And if you do stuff on the web, you are really beholden to Facebook for traffic. And you're really beholden to Google for you know, like for inbound search. And so you have these like these couple of massive companies that control a massive part of, of your business. And, and and like in the case of YouTube, it's even worse than the web because you have to do all of your business on their platform as well. And podcasting doesn't have that right now. And mm. it never has. Apple has has been the the directory of choice. And Apple still has the largest app to consume podcasts, but they have really been fairly benevolent in their in their ruling of podcasts. They they've really taken a very light hand to it and have really embraced and empowered the open ecosystem as much as they really could. Uh, so this one company having this massive share hasn't really been a problem for us. And then everybody who's not Apple is is all kind of you know working in the same ecosystem for the most part. And then the difference is that. Spotify did what a few other companies have tried to do before and have met with mixed success, which is to kind of create a walled garden of podcasts that tries to become the default way people listen to podcasts. Hmm. And that normally wouldn't go very far. But the difference here is that with a combination of Spotify's immense existing market share of people listening to music using their apps and also an immense amount of money they've put into it, Spotify has been able to not only acquire a pretty big chunk of market share pretty quickly, but although it's not as big as as uh, most people think it is, but it is still a substantial market share. 
um, but also they've been able to now um, really put a pretty big push of buying exclusive content mm. for Spotify. Right. And this is where it becomes tricky because if you're just trying to get listeners, then everyone's still playing on basically the same footing. Everyone's still, you know, there have been a couple of premium services before that had exclusive content, but they weren't very big. They didn't go very far. So for the most part, you know, an app like Overcast, like my app, it can it can compete pretty easily uh, as well as any other app that's like Overcast. I mean, there's hundreds of podcast apps out there um, and we could all basically play the same catalog of content. Um, and so it's, so it's this wonderful ecosystem of all this creativity and all these wonderful tools and different apps for different preferences. Um, it's, with a few exceptions, very privacy respective, uh, very uh, creator friendly. It puts a lot of control in yes. the creator's hands. Yes, the creator um, gets to decide, hey, I have this RSS feed. <clears throat> you can use it under these rules. And if you break those rules, I can restrict your access to it. When we get back from this quick break, Dan, I want to take your temperature on what you think the Joe Rogan Spotify deal is. And if that is going to become an ongoing trend and what it means for the business of the open source, open platform world of podcasting when we get back on this week in startups. All right, with SendPro Online from Pitney Bowes, you can simply print postage stamps and shipping labels even when working remotely, which, let's face it, a lot of us are doing. For as low as just $4.99 a month, you'll have access and discounts of up to 40% off USPS Priority Now. And you're now going to get up to 62% off UPS daily rates. They get all these great deals uh, with SendPro Online. Plus, since you're a This Week in Startups listener, you're going to receive a free 30-day trial to get you started, and you're going to get a free 10-pound scale. And what that does is it ensures you never overpay, because that's what I used to do. I just overpay every time. I have no idea how many thousands of dollars I wasted. So you know the benefits. You're going to be able to print those shipping labels. You're going to be able to print those stamps, even when you're working remotely. And you're going to save 62% off UPS Second Day Air. You're going to schedule all your package pickups and track shipments from departure to arrival, soup to nuts, you'll save five cents on every first class letter and up to 40% on USPS priority mail, which is a secret weapon. It works incredibly well, starting at just $4.99 a month. That's $4.99. Calculate the exact postage, get access to the mobile app and ship and track your packages on the go. Print from your PC, avoid trips to the post office, kind of important right now. All you got to do is go to pb.com, not peanut butter, Pitney Bowes, pb.com slash twist to access this special offer for a free 30-day trial plus a free 10-pound scale to get you started. That's pb.com slash twist. Experience the savings in your shipping costs with a free trial of SendPro Online from Pitney Bowes. All right, Marco Arment is here. He's M-A-R-C-O-A-R-M-E-N-T on the Twitter. He's pretty active, um, and uh, he uh, has a website, marco.org. And of course, he makes the best podcasting app, in my personal opinion. It's the one I use is my daily. I'll, I'll, I'll use Spotify from time to time. I'll use i iTunes, the Apple Podcast. Um, but Overcast is my default, mainly because I love the queue uh, and I love the custom settings. The queue to me is everything. I just start at the top of my queue. I work my way down and I have my paid podcast in one area. It's just a great product. Dan, when you hear Marco talk about, hey, you know, Spotify now has this big chip stack. I'm adding that piece. And they're going to take something like Joe Rogan, which is, the, I think, the number one podcast in the world. And they're going to say, you know what? It's now uh, going to, we're going to control it. We're going to control it 100%. Maybe there'll be clips here or there, but no more RSS feed. It's not going to be available on other players. It's an exclusive. Whereas when they bought um, Bill Simmons's company, I think for 200 or so, 250. They said, hey, the podcast will almost all be available still on RSS. We may cherry pick some content. What do you think about this change? We've only seen like a couple of examples of this. And then there's Luminary, which I think is failing um, pretty hard, actually, because I mean, there's so much great content out there that for me, like Russell Simmons, I'm interested in maybe listening to Russell Simmons, but I'm not interested in paying for Russell, not Russell Simmons, Russell Brand. Yeah, I, I think that they're uh, they're the one that is the easiest for everybody to see how that one's going. I think there's probably a lot of situations like Luminary, we just don't don't know as much about their financials. Uh, but agreed. But but to get back to the Rogan thing, I mean, look to me, this is another domino to fall that 
for those of us that have been working in this field for a long time, you know, a decade or longer, some of us, um, you know, it's been getting gentrified for a while. And, you know, I think to some extent, this is, uh, this harkens back to like Howard Stern moving from terrestrial radio to Sirius uh, or XM at the time. But I, I think it, it it suggests a general trend. And this really started in 2018. You know, the shot across the bow that I saw was when iHeart picked up Stuff Media for like $55 million. And then one by one, you keep seeing these things happen. Now, Rogan, because he's top dog, that one's getting the most headlines. But I think this is just one in a succession of many. And unfortunately, I think that it is... Um, for, and fortunately, I think that this is the new way that this is going to go. You know, this is Starbucks moving into the, the hipster town and everybody goes, oh man, it's getting so commercial. It's going to happen. It's going to ruin some things that we love about podcast. It's going to open up opportunities as well. And I think. What is the you know, opportunity to open? So yeah. Uh, potentially better, uh, listener experiences, you know, you've got real horsepower behind groups like Spotify that are, that are coming in and can actually, um, you know, like how long have people been, uh, uh, complaining about discoverability, Mm -hmm. you know, and recommendations, you know, how, how about navigability being able to go, you know, you, you can't talk to the thing right now, but, and we may talk about this later in our conversation here today, but, you know, think about the opportunity with connected voice and what's going to happen as that industry keeps emerging and what real players are going to be able to do to evolve the listening experience. Um, And they're also just going to be able to resource some programs that is really, really hard in kind of the ragtag way that most of us have come to love the industry. Um, so I, I think it's both. I think there's a, a good and a bad, but, but what you have to understand is that there's really two worlds that are starting to split off here. This place was built by venture capital backed startups. You know, I was at the beginning and we launched brands like Dollar Shave Club, um, Zip Recruiter, Blue Apron, MeUndies. These were companies that came in and we put them on podcasts because frankly, they couldn't afford to do a lot else other than, you know, search. Hmm. And, and, and and that's why we've had all these crazy promo codes and vanity URLs uh, for, all, for all these reasons, because these are performance marketers. They're counting customers when they buy the ads. Now, that's not going to be what gets podcasts to the next level. That's what got us here. What gets the ecosystem to the next level is when they get brand dollars. So Coors you know, when, Light, which is a sponsor exactly. of our podcast now, and I'm, do, I'm, I'm popping open a Chris Coors Light once in a while. You know what I thought when I saw it, uh, Marco, and I think I may have responded to you on Twitter about this is... What I like about this is I think it now turns, I don't want to see, uh, you know, the top 200 podcasts all get taken off the market. But if one or two get picked off and they become platform specific, it's almost like, you know, Issa Rae going from YouTube to HBO and having a bigger budget. Okay, fine. But it opens up another slot because the number one podcaster is gone. We all get to move up one in the ranking. So as long as it doesn't become a huge trend, if people want to cash out like Howard Stern did and lose, you know, because I think Joe Rogan loses audience in this. He's going to lose audience. So, Marco, what do you think about that as like a sort of counter? And is it is it okay for people to get cherry picked? Or do you think we're actually in an existential problem where what happened with RSS and blogs was Twitter, I don't think supports RSS anymore. Medium doesn't support RSS and RSS players all went all the RSS readers went away except for maybe FeedBurner. I mean, RSS, there's still a, a you know, community of, of nerds like me who use it every day. Yeah. Um, but, you know, certainly it isn't as big as it used to be and i think that's largely because the world of blogs isn't as big as it used to be uh and that that has lots of effects or, or causes to it um i think you can you can point directly to social networks and and timelines yeah. being the way people consume and produce most information these days as as probably the biggest reason um but going back to your question um i think you know there is some degree of certainly audience loss like you know when howard stern moved to sirius uh, he did like I went with him, but most people didn't go with. He him. lost ninety percent of his audience. He went from right. twenty thirty million a day to like two. Right, and and this is why you know when when somebody like Rogan moves to a single app, he does have the advantage that Spotify is a big app, and by by most numbers, Spotify seems to have something like ten percent market share of podcast listening uh, apps. And, and that's that's a lot, you know. That's that's and they they achieve that fairly quickly, so that's not nothing. But that's not the entire market. 
Right. And people people know from the world of video apps, like, you know, if you want to watch your TV shows through an app, you have to have 17 different apps to watch all the shows you want to watch because so every network and everything has its own thing. Nobody wants that. No, no Consumers hate that. Nobody would, would accept that if they had much of a choice. And right now, podcasting has gone all this time where the vast majority of content people listen to can be accessed in one app. And it's even better. It can be one of like 100 apps. But it's like you can just have one app on your phone and hear all your podcasts. And so, so great, when, yeah. when one or two podcasts have have been purchased and moved to exclusive deals with somebody, they do lose a lot of audience. And we do, like I hear from them from, you know, Overcast customers. I hear from them from as, you know, I, I see people online complaining to them that they can't, listen in their podcast app anymore and the biggest thing i hear is they mostly stop listening to that to those shows so i think that's the bottom line like didn't yeah uh, like russell brand and we have the corollary of howard stern like russell brand like he must have a fraction of the listeners since he went to luminary right what what was the size of the check you think it took for what does anybody know the details of um, the Joe Rogan deal, and then what does Luminary pay people to move their podcasts and lose ninety eight percent of their audience? Do you I know, no Marco? Idea. Do you do you it's, know, Dan? Yeah, I, I don't know the Luminary numbers. Um, I mean, look, let, let's be honest. It, that show was not a much of a known quantity in the okay. ecosystem previously. It could um, have been though, because he gets great guests. Yeah, I mean, but look, that's the problem with with so much accessibility on this stuff, though, is there's a million celebrities that have a podcast now. There's a new one born every day, and they all have amazing guests, right? So you've yeah. got a bit of an overchoice problem, and I think uh. it makes it... And so what you see happening is when you talk to a celebrity and they're like, oh, I'm thinking about starting a podcast, what they don't realize is that they're going to have their their famous friends on and they're going to get 20,000 people listening and they're not going to make any money for a long time if they're doing it that way. Yeah. But I, you know, I think with Rogan, he had crossed over. I mean, he's on a whole nother level that really nobody else has seen except for maybe like an Ira Glass and, you know, good, good for him for cashing out and, and getting his money. Um, and I, I don't know. I think there were some projections and, and it's probably, I suspect north of a hundred million that he saw that he's going to see for that. But what is but it? I don't Did know anybody know the duration of it? Is it a five year deal, four year deal? Ooh, it was a long time. I haven't looked at it. I'm guessing it's going to be like a five. I think it's going to be like a five year deal and they just yeah. represent it. Do you think they'll take the ads out of it, Dan? That's what we're waiting to find out. I got some some clients that are uh, hoping that he doesn't, uh, as am I. But but again, like that's, yeah, I think it's one step at a time. Like step one is like move them over, show that you did it right, mm. and then they're going to have to figure out if they're really going to push the revenue aspect of this because right now everybody's competing for share, right? Everybody's trying to show that they've got critical mass, they've got real numbers. Now when they actually have to start justifying the purchase. Uh, they may find that subscriptions, they can give away 90% of the audience they get on their platform and only give it to premium subscribers. And they may need to do that math later. But I think they're going to have to let the dust settle, see how many people follow them over, see what those numbers look like and how much they can get from advertising, whether or not that pencils without a subscription component. I'd be surprised if it doesn't land in a hybrid model. All right, when we get back from this quick break, I want to uh, talk to Marco about video podcasts. People have been reticent to do video because, let's face it, it's 10 times as much work uh, to do video. But I wonder if you're thinking about with Overcast and, um, you know, now everybody's Zooming and Zencaster is going to start, which is a recording tool for recording podcasts, is got a video beta they're working on, Josh, over there. So I want to know what you think of uh, video in relation to this sort of next decade of podcasting we have back on this week in startups. How would you like $100 to spend on LinkedIn advertising right now? Have you ever tried LinkedIn advertising? Well, it works brilliantly. Why does it work brilliantly? Listen, I don't even have to look at the ad copy because we use LinkedIn. Over 78% of B2B marketers rate LinkedIn as the most effective social media platform for reaching their objectives. Why do 78% of them say this? It's very simple. LinkedIn has over 62 million decision makers on their platform, and that means people are ready to do business. Imagine you're about to launch a marketing campaign. It tested really well, that's great. Your team is happy, everything's going according to plan, except for that one thought in the back of your head, huh? You're thinking, how do I ensure people I wanna target will be in the mindset to receive my message? Are they 
Are they ready for the message? Well, the answer is LinkedIn. When you market on LinkedIn, your message reaches people who are ready to do business. They're on LinkedIn. They're in a business mindset, okay? LinkedIn will help you reach your short and your long-term business goals with tools for brand building and lead generation. Lead gen, super important. And you want to target that professional by their job title, by their company name, by their location. I mean, this is just... You can, we're talking about super targeting that you cannot do on any other platform. And you can engage people you know have already visited your site. That's called retargeting. You may have heard of it. Here is that call to action you've been waiting for. $100 in advertising credit towards your first LinkedIn campaign. Just think about that. $100 if you type in the domain linkedin.com slash this week in startups. You get the hundy right there. LinkedIn.com slash this week in startups. And that means terms and conditions, of course, apply. LinkedIn.com slash This Week in Startups. Let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, we're talking about the state of podcasting with Dan Granger. He is at Oxford Road. That's Oxford underscore road on the Twitter. And of course, Marco Armand, who is very famous uh, for being just a product genius. You probably know Tumblr, uh, which was just transcended in the microblogging space, really defined it along with Twitter. And then Overcast, which I think... I don't. What's the footprint of Overcast now? Is I, I I think you show how many paid users you have on like the page with who's paying. Do you still do that? Um, it's just like I show like how many have upgraded this week. So it's never uh, like a total, but it, it is a a running number. But what, what, you know, what percentage is the, wise, yeah. uh, market share wise, by Libsyn's numbers, which I think are the most broad numbers that are publicly released anywhere. Um, by Libsyn's numbers, I have um roughly like two and a half percent market share of the podcast space which sounds like a little and it is percentage wise a little uh, but it's actually one of the biggest apps by, by having it puts you in the top 10 right for sure yeah i think i think it puts in like the top three actually <laughs> it depends yeah, top on, three, on yeah. who you're how you're ranking but yeah yeah I, I, well, i'm very happy with it uh and what is the uh and, and then the model is i don't even know what i pay is it 50 bucks a year 30 bucks a year not even so you it's free for almost any use uh, but if you want to be able to turn off the ads for podcasts uh, like, I, like i don't run ads for anything else i run ads for other podcasts that are just little visual banners in the app that you could if you want to get more listeners to your show you can buy an ad in overcast and promote your podcast it's a native ad of course it's in a podcast player um and so if you want to turn off those ads as a listener you can pay ten dollars a year that's it. It's only ten bucks a year. I feel like yeah. I pay ten bucks a month for it. And what you I can like if you it, want. <laughs> okay, change my subscription. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I mean, you just think about. It. I use podcasting apps at least an hour. I use your app at least an hour a day. It's always in my top three. It's like Twitter, my Superhuman, and then uh, Overcast are my top three apps in my weekly report on my iPhone. When we left for the break, I wanted to know how you think about video today uh, and where that's going. Are you seeing Honestly, more of it? Do users want it? Because a lot of people are doing video clips now. What do you think about video? I think it's a totally different thing. And mm -hmm. it always has been and it always will be. You know, we right now we're doing a lot of video stuff because a lot of people are at home. Um, a lot of podcast listening did go down. I think I saw, I forget the exact numbers, but it was something like a 15% decline um, during the worst of the U.S. quarantine this past spring. And then it slowly has come back up again since then to the point where now we're pretty much at pre-quarantine levels of all of almost all metrics I have. Um, but although that's scary in a different way. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. we uh, for the most part, I think video has always been separate. Hmm. Uh, and video podcasts have always been something that you create for different reasons and that you consume in different places in different contexts. One of the reasons why people love podcasts, audio podcasts, is that they can listen to them while their body is busy doing something. Their eyes may be busy doing something, but that their their brain and their ears can listen. So, you know, obviously the big, biggest thing people usually do listening to podcasts is commuting yep. um, or otherwise driving. But also you can, like, I listen all the time when I'm walking my dog or even just doing dishes or we can put on a podcast while my wife and I are having breakfast together and we can just listen to a show together. It's, it, there. there's ways that you can play podcasts while you are otherwise like visual, visibly occupied, like your eyes are occupied. That is the magic of else. it, right? Which has always been the magic of, you know, like even Howard Stern or back in the day, other, you know, national personalities. Yeah, it's in the background at work. People are working in a factory. They're working at their office. They could have it in the background. Maybe somebody gets upset. Maybe somebody doesn't. Uh, but does that mean you would never, because we have a video feed. I think it does pretty good. Um, do you think you'll ever support video or do you support video now? I never noticed. I don't support video now, and I don't really plan to. I mean, unless things really radically change, I could obviously reconsider. But 
I right now I don't I don't see the need for it. I I think I can make a I can make a much better app that is much more focused on what it does well by only doing audio because that's what most people want out of their podcast player. I think. All right, so Dan, going over to you with video. I have recently been investing in our YouTube presence. Uh, in fact, like we're doing clips and we got 140,000 subscribers or something. We get a nice 10, 20, 30,000 video views each, each episode. And, and, you know, obviously some of them break out over time. And I'm thinking I'm going to keep investing there because we do this to build deal flow for my angel investing business. And cause I love doing it. It's not really a, a business as such and it's as a standalone business. What, what is the, what is the percentage of advertisers who care about the video component? Do they care at all? Do video podcasts have an advantage over audio only ones? And what do you think video plays into the future of all this? Uh, okay, so long and short, I think it's a good idea for content creators. You know, I, if I were Marco, I'm not sure I'd do anything different than what he's doing. Um, but I if I'm you, I would absolutely, uh, you know, I'm, I'm big into omni channel. I think that some of the most successful shows that, that help advertisers grow and really drive performance are the ones that don't limit their distribution possibilities. And so, you know, some of the best performing shows that are out there are simulcast through everywhere that people get podcasts, but then also on YouTube. Mm. Because it, it, for the same reason that you say, you know, Rogan's going to lose people when he goes to Spotify, people are partial to their primary platform. And as such, you're going to benefit from being somewhere that they like to get their content. So it's not that you're necessarily doing something visually interesting. It's just that there's people that want to consume it that way. So give them what they want. What, what do you uh, think about um, these uh, pop-up podcast-like talk products? Uh, uh, Marco, are you on um, Clubhouse yet? Or some of these other ones that are going to like do spon more spontaneous audio? Because for me, podcasting is really special, I think, because people who don't feel comfortable in front of a camera, I did TV work for a long time, so I don't have a problem with it, but... It, you know, podcasting makes it really easy for people who are shy and don't want to be on camera to, to do this. And it also takes out 90, I would say at least 95% of the work editing and handling video files is just a disaster. So what, what are your thoughts on uh, those new spontaneous audio ones and the state of the creation tools? Because I always thought Overcast Pro should be a podcast creation app where I could be listening to a podcast in Overcast and then maybe build a podcast myself. Have you ever thought about getting into the podcast creation business or this kind of like listen together or clubhouse type features? Um, so with the disclaimer that I haven't seen clubhouse yet because I'm not cool enough to be on the beta. And frankly, that that's wise. I wouldn't probably even try it. I'm too, too busy <laughs> doing my own stuff. But yeah, but, uh, but you know, with that caveat, uh, I, I think, you know, so these are actually two, two very different questions here. So yes. question, question number two, which I'll take first, of course, is, uh, you know, whether I would have creation and overcast. And I think, again, this is like a very different area of a product. And the I think the biggest reason to have creation be bundled with a player is if your goal is to make a big ad network and use the player's metrics to inform the ad network. And we see that a lot. We see that throughout mm. the industry. Uh, obviously, Spotify has done that by buying Anchor. That's part of the that's part of the thing there. Um, some smaller players do it as well. Uh, but I'm not really interested in that in making that kind mm. of business. Um, it's that's not just where my passions are or my skill set, frankly. Um, so I, I don't think I, I think I'd rather just keep Overcast be being a player. And I do also make production tools, but they're not part of Overcast. They're their own things. Um, just what are those? I'm, um, so I make one called uh, Forecast. That's that's ah. that's probably the big one. It's a post production tool. That lets you add. Uh, it's a very fast MP3 encoder. Unless you add chapter marker, uh, markers. Oh, and we other, use uh, it all the time. We love that. Yes, the you do. <laughs> Did you come out with the chapter? Was that your innovation? Chapters. No, I didn't make chapters. Um, oh. I did take advantage of a couple of parts of the spec that no one else was really doing to make them a little bit um, more interesting and a little bit. Um, there's a little bit more dynamic functionality you can do with forecast and overcast uh, that's not yet widely supported in other, in other players. Like you can have a chapter that shows up without appearing in the list. You can just display an image or a link in a certain time range, but not uh, have it be like a semantic chapter per se. Anyway, that's, that's a nerdy so thing. So it's almost like a, um, it's, it's like a shadow chapter. It's yeah, a, basically. A, yeah, I so like that a the, lot. the idea, like you know, we I've had so many people pitch me uh, the you know ideas about we need to extend the podcasting standards and build in support to all these clients so that we can do rich content. I'm like, okay, what does that mean? And what they describe, what they want to do, usually boils down to 
being able to show metadata at a certain time range. It's like, well, you can already do that, you know. You like we have that already. It's yeah. called chapters. It's supported in almost every app. But nobody uh, uses it. Like is that. it in Apple Podcasts? Doesn't do it. Spotify doesn't do chapters. I never see chapters. Spotify doesn't so Spotify is not a, a great podcast uh, no, playing it's app, like you know, it's, by by these metrics, but um Apple does support chapters. They uh, they have forever in the uh, M4A format and they recently added MP3 chapter support, which is what forecast generates. Um, there, it's not every app supports all of the features of chapters, but mm. almost every app supports at least the basics. And so it is a great way to display timed metadata along with playback. And so, it's like, also there's so many respectful of the content creator because when people hit that chapter, you haven't ripped up my podcast and put it on your servers. And now I can't see data on listens, right? We're just uh, directing no, I mean, people all- to it. It's all client side. This is all right. happening client side. Like you as the creator bake the chapters into the file as ID3 tags. Right. And then the player plays it and it's just it's whatever you specified. And if you don't put a chapter you there, you gotta then do a better job. Out. You gotta do a better job in overcast of like explaining to people that it's there because you have to swipe left to see it. I think it should be the default. Like when you're playing, if chapters exist, why doesn't it just show chapters by default? Is it just like some hidden Easter egg right now? No, well, I mean, it's it's it shows them kind of like above the scrubber bar and a little like chapter forward button. But uh, admittedly, yeah, the the now playing screen needs a lot of work. This is an area where I'm, I'm working quite a bit, actually. I love your now playing screen. I'll be totally honest. I love that I can very quickly change the speed. I love your forward in advance. But I just think chapters is... I would love for chapters where if you clicked on them, it would open to a transcript or it open to a rich transcript with links. What do you think of, Dan clips and are you thinking about clips because we are doing a lot of work on doing clips on social media and as you know i put in my second reply on twitter the advertisement for that podcast to give them extra play i want you to talk about clips of podcasts when we get back on the screen all right this deal from vanta is so good i want to start my ad read with it vanta is giving our twist listeners think about this a thousand dollars off their first sock two by going to vanta.com slash twist. That's not a joke. $1,000 off vanta, V-A-N-T-A dot com slash twist. So why is SOC 2 compliance so critically important? Well, if you don't have your SOC 2 buttoned up, you can't close major customers because major customers have security concerns and they should. And if you already have your SOC 2 report, don't you want to make it easier to maintain it year after year after year? Of course you do. Well, Vanta's software continuously tests against technical and non-technical SOC 2 requirements. They partner with over a dozen audit firms who have been trained to file SOC 2 reports directly within Vanta. On average, Vanta customers are SOC 2 compliant in just two to four weeks. Compare that to three, four, five months if you're not using Vanta. You'd be crazy not to use Vanta. I just had a twist listener. You guys and gals are so good to me. You tell me when you use the products and you always use those promo codes. Super important. Well, I had John Hegrains, who's a founder and CEO of a drone startup. It's called Kitty Hawk. Everybody knows it. They've raised a lot of money. Super important company. Uh, And he said Vanta was essential in helping them get their SOC 2 compliancy set up and maintained. And he loves the tie-ins with Google, Slack, GitHub, and AWS, which is really essential for Kitty Hawk's business. Use Vanta, people, and get that $1,000 off, just like Notion, Lattice, user testing, and hundreds of other successful companies who got their SOC 2 reports with Vanta in weeks, not months. Unlock those sales and give your employees all that time back in their calendar to work on more business-critical assignments. There's so much you got to get done right now. Use an expert. That expert is Vanta. And they're giving Twist listeners $1,000 off their subscription at vanta.com slash twist. I don't know how long they're going to keep this going, so I want you to take advantage of it right now. Vanta.com slash twist. All right, listen, podcasts are taking over. Why are they taking over? Eh, I'm going to ask my guest in a minute. My humble opinion is, man, social media is just a place for fighting and bickering and just bots and stupidity uh, in in the overwhelming majority of the noise. But when you want to have a long considered conversation like we're having now, podcasts are such a reprieve from the the inaneness of uh, social media and the lack of depth. And we kind of get back to expertise. And boy, do we have expertise today. Dan Granger runs Oxford Road, which is one of, I don't know, what are you, one of the top three agencies in podcasting? I mean, you kind of pioneered this all. Yeah. 
I, I think that's fair. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, and you uh, started working with all those D to C direct consumer companies, but now it's expanding. Um, I'm curious what you think of clips and what you think of sort of micro content and this growing trend where people are clipping up the podcasts and and people maybe consuming little pieces of it. Right. I, well, first of all, I, as a promotional tool, you know, samples are always the best if you can do it. And when you're in entertainment of any kind of product, you want to show a trailer, you want to give people a taste of what they're going to get if they come for the whole thing. Right. Hmm. So I think a, as a promotional vehicle all day long, everywhere you can get it where there's a like audience that might have an interest in that. I think you're touching on something that's very important when we talk about what the next revolution is going to be um, in the space because the thing has to keep evolving. And and I am predicting that I think um, multi-length content is going to be a big deal. Well, wait, define what multi-length content is. Basically, not every show has to be an hour long. Oh, I see what you're saying. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. The show ends when it's not interesting, which is how Howard Stern started doing it. Right. Joe Rogan, I do it, everybody. Right. But but at the same time, you know, if you I don't know how far you've gone with Alexa and flash briefings, but I think there's a very interesting model that's starting to occur where you can actually string together little samples of your favorite news outlets and get them in bite sizes and yes. through voice command, tell them what you want next, put them in any order that you want. And it's in constant rotation and being refreshed all the time. Now, that hasn't really connected yet with the personality driven ecosystem that is podcast right now It's very focused on news. News, but I think that's going to change. I'm calling that right now. I think that's going to be a big, big deal because look, I may want to hear everything that you have to say this week, and yet I've only got 10 minutes for you. Mm. Can I get a best of? Can I get it curated so that I can have some of, so I can have the highlights or I can pick and choose more? I, I Yeah, I, I think the best of in the clips is kind of interesting. The thing I don't like, which I'm seeing more of Marco is people taking my show and other shows, clipping them, and then inserting advertising in between them. And I I think Stitcher did this to me at some point, and I went bonkers on the Stitcher per people. I was like, guys, uh, what are you doing? Like, you, you're, because you're, they were selling ads in front of the podcast. I'm and like, you didn't we, get a taste? And I didn't get my beak wet. And I'm like, yeah. hey guys, you're, and I, the reason I found out about it is because one of their salespeople, I think, um, listen, if it wasn't Stitcher, I'm sorry, but it was one of them. And uh, and I, it, I turned out I knew somebody who was running, and I said, if you're gonna, if you're gonna have your salespeople saying they're selling ads before my podcast or in between my podcast and this week in tech or whatever it is, like I'm, I'm going to block you from using our feed, and I'm going to send you a legal letter. And they backed down, and they said, well, what would it take? I said, don't do it. I don't want your ads anywhere near. I don't want you selling it. I don't want 30% of what you sell. I don't want 100% of what you sell. I don't want you selling against my ads. What are your thoughts on, on this sort of growing trend? Well, the good thing is that that has mostly not happened recently. Like that, that I think you're right. That was Stitcher back in the day, and they they did stop doing it eventually because it caused so much blowback. Um, but the good oh, thing so is that- I got that, it right. It was Stitcher, right? Good. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, yeah. The good thing is that- uh, now you are in full control for the most part. That platforms like Spotify, I'm pretty sure, either already has announced plans to do that, or at least you, when you when you sign up for Spotify to have your podcast playable in Spotify, mm. uh, you agree to let them do things like that. Mm. Um, and that's why, like you know, apps like Overcast, I don't have to ask everybody to play their podcasts. I don't have to have you opt in and agree to my terms. I'm just reading your RSS feed and playing what's there. And if I don't yeah. like, if I don't. In, inject my own ads in the middle of your show uh, mm. that nobody has, has any problem with that because that's fine right I'm just playing the RSS feed that's there um, but if you have a platform that's going to start doing that to your content that's going like, to really like modify it like that uh, then they have to get your, your permission by by most interpretations of, of the copyright issues here so the good thing is that those platforms if they if they still exist at all tend to be opt-in the bad thing is that if Spotify gets so much market share that you pretty much have to opt in to have your stuff yeah. reach a big audience, then you basically lose control of yourself. And this is this is the YouTube problem, right? Like, if you want to have video out there in the world that anybody sees, you pretty much have to agree to whatever YouTube dictates. Right. Uh, and so, again, like, this is why I, I try very hard to not let this happen in the podcast space. If any app gets, like, significant market share and they start dictating terms, we're all going to have to agree to them. And that's not a good place to be for creators or listeners, frankly. And so that's why it's so important to keep this ecosystem as open as possible and to to actively fight against 
you know entities like spotify that are that are that are going the other direction yeah i mean i think i know daniel pretty well at spotify and you know i t- i gave him some advice on the early on with the podcasting stuff just over email like hey you know this you know you should probably do this and we were part of their beta which was very nice of them to include us and i guess we're going to be part of the video thing when they open it up they're, they're not he- doing you a favor <laughs> Well, <laughs> here's not- the thing. I, I the way I look at it is, the, it, as long as they allow, I would prefer they opt people into any advertising program, um, and just me, because you know defaults matter. We always say that in this industry, the default matters. And if Daniel were to do it, where he defaulted it, where he started putting ads against my stuff, uh, and I didn't have a choice, I would write a blog post and I would say how wrong he is, and I would challenge every other podcaster to do that so he's a reasonable person who i think respects content creators so i don't have a problem with exclusive content but i would have a problem with like you this is why youtube makes me a little nervous even investing in their ecosystem is because you're right marco like they could just delist you and you spend a year building on it and you're just like oh where's my channel and then you had no recourse you can't even, there's nobody to talk. I mean, I can. I'm Jason Calacanis. I can email Susan Wojcicki if I want to, and she's going to respond or else I'm going to go ham But uh, on Twitter or something. But, you know, if you're just a civilian or somebody with a small pocket, you can't get any recourse. That's the problem with these big platforms, isn't it, Marco? Totally. I mean, the reason why podcasting is so great for creators and for listeners, but especially from the creator side, is that there's basically three big things that ruin everything else that we don't have here yet. Distribution gatekeepers, ad tech, and uh, I forgot the third one. <laughs> anyway, no, ad tech like, is a good one. Because ad tech, we don't have that. Like our ad tech is so primitive, right? That like we, that's a like, feature for me. Me too, and I've and I fight to keep it that way. <laughs> well, I don't because, want you taking my data of my listeners. I don't want YouTube taking it. I don't want my I don't want my users to give up any of their data. Oh, and number three was algorithms. That's what it was. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't have like recommendation algorithms that really control what people see and what they don't see. Hmm. They they exist in the podcast hmm. ecosystem, but they're they're not really major influencers in what people see. I um, like your so, collect. You have collections, right? You have like ranked lists and collections. When yeah, those are discover. those are pretty much just top lists um, combined with like how how many users are recommending them at any given time, and that's about it. And and you know for Good the most enough. part. Yeah, for the most part, I'm I'm doing a basic, you know, for for most most shows are added by search by name. Mm. Um, most most new podcast subscriptions are not happening by casually browsing the categories. They're happening by number one is searching for them by name. Yep. And number two is the recommendations of like listeners who like this will also like this. Did and you? That's also, just based on who subscribes to what. You also created when when I search because I do this before I have a podcast. Like I had the Nicola you know, the car company uh, CEO mm-hmm. on the public trade car company, I searched for him in Overcast. And not only did it look through the podcasts I subscribed to, it looked through all podcast descriptions. You do that, right? You have like an index of all search. Yeah, I have a full text search on the server side. Yeah. See, this is the thing for discovery that's been amazing for me because the way you do it is so brilliant. Up top is, hey, he's been on this week in tech or, you know, Nicola has been on, you know, this podcast. But then here are podcasts you don't subscribe to that he's been on. So you have to create that entire search index and keep it maintained. Oh, yeah. See, this is a killer, killer feature. I, I love that uh, feature. But were you the one who said your data is my liability? Yeah, pretty much. Like, you know, especially Explain what GDPR. you meant by that. Yeah. Yeah. So like ever since GDPR, um, it, I've taken an, an even larger privacy stance, but and I'm actually going to go further in this direction uh, in an upcoming version of Overcast. Uh, I'm going to um, probably anger some people, but I don't care. Um, the idea here is like, I don't want a- a- any private data. Like if, if I can, like private data should be treated like nuclear waste. Nobody should want to possess this. Mm-hmm. And if you can get away with doing your job and having your company function without getting a piece of private information, you should not capture it. And so Overcast has gone very heavy in that direction. I've, I was always, you know, pretty privacy focused, but, you know, in recent years, I've tried to do as much as I can to get rid of as many email addresses as I can. I've stopped logging IP addresses anywhere, even like in server logs, like there's just no IP logging, nothing based on IP addresses anywhere. So you in the don't system. know what I listen to. If um, unless you have an email address in your account, then I could, you yeah. know, then it's sitting there in the, data, in the database. But if you have an anonymous account, which is the default and has been for some time, and you can convert an email account to anonymous with one yeah. click, um, then I have no idea what which the other is yours. thing you did that was really smart is people were doing the old tracking pixel in their show notes. Mm-hmm. And I noticed because I was listening to Scott Adams's podcast, which I like to listen to like all the people on the far right or people on the far left. And it's one of the things I love about podcasting is I can listen to Rachel Maddow, Ben Shapiro, Sam Harris, 
you know, and uh, Scott Adams and get like a view of the world in 15 minutes of each of their podcasts. That's incredibly diverse set of perspectives. But I, when I looked at Scott Adams, he's always trying to hawk his uh, books, like his influence books, but you turn those images off by default. You make me click to see them, right? That's right. Yeah. Because, you know, again, like I, I, I think ad tech really has ruined a number of things in other industries. And I try to keep it relatively at bay for podcasting. Now, there is the giant hole that when you download the podcast, that download request is going to the publisher servers, and they can do whatever they want with your IP address at that point. Uh -huh. But I don't like any ability for them to track what's happening in my app without my knowledge and without my customer's knowledge. And so besides that download request that I really can't control for, again, copyright reasons, um, besides that, I try to block any attempt to track like what when they've played the podcast, uh, mm. when the podcast has been viewed in the app, et cetera. That I think they have no right to, and uh, and it, it right. opens up too many problems. So you um, could actually too much liability. You can't cache my MP3 file because it's right. mine. But uh, if I if you automatically download it, it's on my hardware. Then I'm not hitting it live. Therefore, they can't see that and. You could theoretically cache the show notes so that they don't know that they opened. That would be the thing you're referring to possibly doing. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I already cached the show notes. They're just HTML. Um, but like a lot of a lot of um, you know packages would add tracking pixels, as you said, to the show notes. So that way, when the app displayed those show notes in a web view, it would load that image and send the tracking pixel info and give them another IP address. They would try to associate with the first one, et cetera. It was a whole thing. So what what um, is the uh, new feature that you're going to do to to make it even more privacy? What's the what's the new uh, idea here? Well, podcasting has a pretty big problem in the in its ad tech world, and that is for GDPR compliance, you need people to opt in to being tracked. And there is mm -hmm. no way to opt in to a podcast app uh, to to the tracking that's being done on a on a publisher server. Mm -hmm. um, and they can tell you once you've played the podcast, by the way, we do these things like, you know, they could say that in the audio. They don't, yeah. but they could and they should. Uh, but there's no way for you to know before you have already mm. given them your IP address by uh, downloading one of their files. Um, and so what I'm working on is a way to disclose what hosts people's files and what services they're putting their files through ah. and link to their privacy policies right there in the app so that everybody can see oh, that's great. before downloading the podcast. Great. This this podcast uses this tracking package, this stats package, this ad serving pl platform, et cetera. Yeah, I'm not and touching, here's their privacy policies. I'm not touching those stats packages. I just put ours on AWS and I'd, I've been having all those companies pitch me that they're going to be able to build all this data. I was like, no fucking way am yeah. I letting you anywhere near those mp3 files and then i was like some advertisers like we'll pay you and but we're not going to do it unless you track all your customers i told them to fuck off i was like i don't care i don't need your money like i don't want you it's kind of creepy anyway i dan i gotta get you in on this because you're on the inside of the business and you want to have data and you want to have attribution what do you think of marco's position and mine which is kind of in the middle i you know i would be fine with people opting into it but i don't i don't like these you know, uh, hardcore data, you know, intermediaries. Do you like those? Are clients putting pressure on you to do those? You know, in my world, we were talking earlier about all the promo codes and vanity URLs, which is so yes. archaic, right? It's ridiculous. And you have, I've never met with a company that didn't say we're a very data driven organization, but like getting people to execute a survey that says, how did you hear about us properly is pulling teeth. And most of the time people get it wrong. Um, so, so there does need to be advancement. We are seeing some success with some of the new players that are coming out and allowing for pixel based attribution. But I mean, look, when it, when it comes to the whole privacy thing, I, I'm personally in the camp that it's like, wouldn't it be great if we could keep our own data to ourselves and didn't and knew what we were opting into and not. But at the same time, look, I have an iPhone, I have Alexa, I've sort of surrendered. And I'm hoping that, you know, the people in power are going to be <laughs> benevolent with that. Yeah. Uh, but but I'm just trying to operate within the the confines of my reality on it. What what do advertisers find so appealing about podcasting today? Um, and how has that changed from the beginning? I mean, we had Volvo sponsor the Autoblog podcast 15 years ago, which we started the same month Dave Weiner created attachments. 
uh, and we just happened to have Volvo. We said, can we read an ad for Volvo during the podcast? It led to a big thing. What if there's a Volvo story on the podcast? And then we read an ad. I was like, yeah, that's kind of happens on the radio too. But wh- how has it changed? You know, five, 10 years ago when you were, some of your customers uh, uh, from, from Oxford wrote about ads here, what were they thinking about in the five to 10 year window? And what are they thinking about now and going forward to the next five years? I How's think at the beginning, it was it was so appealing to D2C brands because they were saying, hey, we've got a new way to do something like, you know, it was novel that we could ship razors to your door on a schedule, right? That yeah. was in a, that was innovative, right? And and at that time, innovative people understood, well, hey, look, if I'm looking for early adopters, this is a great way to do it. The barrier to entry is lower and I can get, you know, Alec Baldwin to read my commercial for free if I spend you know, 10 grand on his podcast versus if I go to CAA, it's going to cost me half a million. Ah, that's so a key. Wait, explain that key observation. Entry, what would it normally explain that? That's a very interesting one. The it, endorsement it, is key, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, well, and that's all it is. And by the way, that's what all of this migration, all of this gentrification we're talking about is going to kill that or at least reduce it. You know, we're, we'll get to a billion on the back of host red ads. Okay. But Guess what's going to happen then? It's going to be dynamic insertion. You're going to go to break. You're going to be, they're going to jam these shows so full of commercials that people won't recognize it. It'll sound like radio in many cases. Mm. Okay. And so when you came in, it was like all the barriers to entry came down. I mean, I came out of terrestrial radio and people would sign half a million dollar, million dollar contracts to lock up a radio host that 90% of the country never heard of, but they could command that. Then all of a sudden, podcast it's like yeah well uh adam carolla or joe rogan will read your spot twice and talk about how great your product is and there's no commitment there's no talent fee there's no talent agent i mean Mm. think of the the barriers to entry that have come down and the accessibility of talent that you used to spend a boatload of money to get access to it's been become very commoditized celebrity has become very commoditized so that's really changed and i think it's going to shift back more the other way but what interesting a, yeah when but, the new but, york times does their podcasts yeah that because i know kara Swi- i talked to kara swisher is a good friend of mine um uh for a long time and she loves to read the ads i love to read the ads we don't have a problem with it mm-hmm. but other journalists are like i'm not reading a fucking ad are you crazy right like, they don't want to do that i don't I, I listen to like still processing is my favorite of the new york times one which i think they're on hiatus is kind of a bummer um but uh they love reading they don't read the ads i don't think yeah. Preet Bahar, my other favorite one of my other favorite he does cafe insider which is paid and then he does stay tuned with preet he preet Bahar, the former southern district attorney of new york he reads ads for casper right uh, how does that uh, sam harris won't read an ad obviously so h- how does this this which host will read ads and which doesn't occur in the industry and how does I that th- impact buys I- in the future so if we're talking about the future i think it's going to be similar to what it is now where most hosts do read ads it's just that there's going to be 10 more minutes per hour of commercial programming that they're jam that they're dynamically inserting right so you'll read the ad and then spotify is going to play a break after your ad, that's something that the ad agency in New York put together and it's going to, you know, have their sonic branding and all that. Is that good or bad? Uh, depends on who you are. If you're a, a major corporation, that's going to be the thing that takes us from a billion to $10 billion. You're very happy because now you can like, I think, l- let me go back to the question you asked earlier, because I want to answer that, which is you said, what's different now versus then, then It was about what's podcasting and how does it work? And I can be a part of something that's innovative. And now it's all FOMO. It's like every big brand is jumping in because they're tired of people hearing, how come I hear all these other companies and I don't hear you guys? And there's a lot Ah. of peer pressure, right? And so they have to be a part of it. The hype on podcasts, you know, there was like, they estimated $60 million of, of, ad revenue went to promoting three different podcasts that one of the major networks was releasing. I believe that the podcast has more free earned media from people talking about podcasting than there's actually dollars in the channel. So there's a lot of hype and whether or not we can What does that mean exactly? The free earned media? Explain that for people who don't know what you're saying. Well, so so think about it this way. Um, COVID hits the media ecosystem like a Mack truck, right? And all of a sudden they've got giant holes in their spot load and you've got 
content creators like radio groups that have 24 seven programming with, you know, 10 to 20 minutes an hour of ads that they're not selling, they're not getting cash for. So they're taking that value and putting it behind their podcast because that's the future. That's what the brands ah, want. That's what yeah. everybody's talking about. So literally somebody did an estimate that there are hundreds of thousands of commercials just to promote podcasts going out right now. That makes because, a ton of sense. Yeah. So now we've basically, this is like we're in the pick and shovel era where like the podcasts are promoting new podcasts. Marco, what does it take in your estimation to make a world-class podcast that develops an audience? When you look across the data, you see all these new podcasts starting, you see the founder, you see the podcasters giving up. Maybe they don't publish regularly, but you also see ones that break out. If you, in your gut over, you know, a decade of being involved in this, what do you think the keys to becoming a success, what makes for a successful podcast host slash podcast franchise? Well, I think it's, it's, it's two main things. Number one is that you have to have some way for people to want to listen to you. So you, you probably have to have an audience already from somewhere else. That really helps a lot. Hmm. Um, you can build up from scratch in podcasting, but it's much harder and much slower. If you have an audience already established in some other place, uh, then you can bring them over to a podcast much more easily, and that gives you a nice little boost. But ultimately, what will keep people there and what will let it develop long term you know, I, I mentioned earlier that like we don't have a lot of like algorithmic uh, players in podcasting. We we basically have a a subscribing model, very similar to RSS, uh, where listeners choose individual subscriber or individual podcast to subscribe to, and then they will receive every episode of that podcast, and they will listen to usually most of them. And so you really have to build these long term relationships with listeners, and the way you do that, besides getting, getting some of them in the door at, up front. The way you keep them there is with host chemistry. Mm. It, you have to have chemistry as the hosts of the show. Whatever format it is, it has to keep people in, interested and involved. And nothing does that more than good personalities of, of the host or hosts. And if you have that over time, if you build that over time, people will stick around. And that's why advertisers are so so you know into podcasts, and that's why our ads work so well and command the best CPMs in the universe. Because people listen to us; they really listen. They they listen to every episode. They listen to what the hosts say. That's why host read ads are somewhat uncomfortably so effective, and and that's why listeners stick around and they listen to the whole show straight through. Like you can look at you know all the the listening data that you can get from places like Apple Podcasts or other platforms to see like. How far do people listen before they drop off the episode? And the truth is most people don't skip the ads and most people listen all the way through. That's what I was about and to ask you because I, I know for me, I always listened to the way Howard Stern read the ads when mm -hmm. I was a kid. And I, you grew up in New York too or in the area? Ohio, Marco, but I, Ohio. I listened to Howard. Yeah. But you listened to Howard as a kid. Uh, I, I'm not sure how old you are, but I'm 49. I'm Gen X. So you maybe listened to him in the 90s or whatever. <clears throat> And he would lead, listen to a Snapple commercial, and he would belch in the middle of the commercial. He would <laughs> make a joke about Jackie. He would, it, and I always try to have a little fun. And I, what I do, my secret, and you know this, Dan, is I, oh, we have whitelisted advertising on this podcast because we were lucky enough to be sold out, and I don't need to make money from it. So I said, I'm only reading ads for things that I feel like I like. Mm -hmm. And in the early days, I just said, if you want to be on the podcast, I'll go tell me what your product is, I'll go buy it and try it and use it. And I would actually do that. And then I'd say, okay, you're okay to be on and we turned down so many advertising. I turned down like, I don't want to mention too many names, but like LifeLock. I, I think we may have done a short ad with them or back. No, it wasn't back It was some other backup software. Anyway, all my users complained about this backup software. It wasn't back I take it back. Crash because plan. I can't remember which one it was, but the problem was my users were power users and they were trying to back up a terabyte and these things would be like unlimited backup until you got to 100 gigs and then they would narrow you down to uploading at, you know, five kilobits or some bullshit. And I was like, guys, I can't read your ad. It's just too much blowback. And, th and that really, uh, I think, sort of helped it. Dan, what are, you, what are your thoughts on the, what makes for a sponsor that ad? Because my secret is I whitelist the advertisers. I say no to one in five maybe two, maybe one in three. I just like, yeah, no, nah, I don't want to read that ad. And then I always insist on doing an onboarding call with them. And I say to them up front, do you want me to freestyle the ad or do you want me to read the ad? And if you want me to read the ad, 
I don't think it's going to work that good. But if you let me freestyle a little bit like I do for Dell or I open a Crisp Cores Lite or Zendesk or LinkedIn, whatever it is, Zendesk, you know, we, we always have a great experience with those advertisers, NetSuite, et cetera. What, what is your best practice for the advertisers with the host red ads? So have fun or don't have ads? Fun, Dan. Look, I think it's, if you if we can get you to have fun, we prefer it, right? But at the end of the day, you've got to think about it a couple different ways. Number one, a host red ad is always going to beat uh, an ad that somebody else writes and inserts into your show. 100% of the time, that's why as we get more dynamic insertion, you'll see bigger premiums for the host red. Now, when you're doing a host red, um, do, does it matter if you believe in the product? We know that it doesn't hurt. It's not always a straight line, though, correlating from your passion to the performance, performance. Sure. And, and and bill burr is like the great case study for that because he can do an ad where he is insulting the advertiser the whole time and it will work fantastically well oh, i didn't know that i, got, I don't oh, listen to bill burr's podcast i gotta get I mean, it and look the exception he, he, that's exceptional right but i've right. seen people put pour their heart and soul out for a commercial nope and then you got somebody that's insulting them or totally apathetic and it works great but i think here's what i think the common denominator is it's your relationship with the audience and if they know that you are somebody who has character that says i don't say things that i don't mean mm. then that gets you don't have to spell that out in the ad for the audience to know that they know that intuitively and that does cause so so when like we've got hundreds of millions of dollars of performance data in house from all these different brands and you know, thousands of podcasts. And what we see is there's an influence factor that nobody publishes that every show has. It's purely based on the trust and engagement they have with their audience. And the ad will be a beneficiary of that to the extent that you have already established it with your audience. But does it help if you go the extra mile? Of course, we like longer ads. We want passionate ads. We want ads that are interesting. All of that helps, but none of it matters. Who's the best? If you don't who, who's the best? Re who's the best readers of the podcast, Chris? <sighs> who do you think? Like, just give me top five, six, right off the top of your head. People who just they, they know, just riff and they do a good job, I, and, and gonna, your advertisers I'm come back a and monument say, to the unknown host because, like, it's the long tail of ones that'll do like an eight minute commercial. Oh, They'll I don't turn like it that. into a I segment. Don't, I, hate I know, but let me tell you something that works. The more oh, it does? the more you tell, <laughs> the more you actually, sell. Absolutely. That's a little over the top. That's a little over who, the who top. Do you, yeah. who, do you, who do you like, yeah, Marco? But, who does a good job reading ads, you think? Um, you uh, like I, these or you find them distasteful, Marco? I do them in my show. You I mean, do them like, in your show. I, who do you read yeah. for? Uh, lots of brands. I, I think we might have some Who do you Oxford's, like to um, read most? Who do you like to read most? <laughs> I think my favorite one to read right now is probably Linode because what do they i do? use them they're a host a web host huh. um and i use them for for my server hosting and uh -huh. and they they basically let me freeform it and love it they and you know it's simple stuff like they buy a lot of inventory they always pay on time they're really easy to work with and yeah, make they, it easy people and i love linode like legitimately that's why like i sought them out as a sponsor because you know jason like you were saying like i i want to be able to use almost everything that i'm doing a sponsor read yeah. for and that way i can actually say legitimately I use this. I like this. This is what it's good at. Um, and people trust me for that because they know that I have standards about that. And and if I'm like, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll read a, an app or something I don't use, but then I won't say I use it. <laughs> like, so you, yeah, can and you don't want to like, lie and be like, I, right, I love <laughs> vape pens. They actually, you know, these vape pens. <laughs> right, Back right. in the day, I got offered a sponsorship for e-cigarettes. I was like, I don't smoke. They're like, no, no, you just, you just got to hold it in your hand when you're at the poker table. We'll, we'll, they literally said to me, we'll pay all your buy-ins for every tournament you want to play at the World Series of Poker. You want to play 100000 you want to play a quarter million, whatever. We just want your e-cigarette hat, e-cigarette thing. This is a lot of money. And they said, whatever you win in the poker tournament, of course you keep, it's yours. I was like, well, fuck that. I'm not smoking e-cigarettes. It's terrible. That, that, that's going to come out to kill people. No fucking right. way am I doing right. that. Like yeah, the writing's smart. on the wall on that one. Uh, but Coors Light, we, I, I actually like Coors Light. It's like one of my favorites. So I crack open a crisp Coors Light. I thought it was, thought it was hilarious that Coors Light even it recognizes podcasting. And I was like, I'll, I'll drink a Coors Light on air because I'll drink a Coors Light after I'm off. Fuck it. I'll do Hit me with a Coors Light right now. I'll fucking crack it right now. I don't care. <laughs> I love go. a Chris Coors Light. And then they're like, oh, Dell. I go, what about cancel culture and, and using uh, Dan, and we'll, we'll wrap up on this, and I appreciate yeah. both of you guys giving me the hour. Um, Dan, you, you have people like Ben Shapiro, who is like this 
brainiac Harvard kid who sometimes says something stupid. He might have some very old world views and like doesn't like transgender people or think that that's an, you know, like he basically could be a religious person who doesn't believe in premarital sex, whatever. And then you have this huge contingent of people now who are saying, hey, if I don't like what you say, and I'm not saying, I mean, listen, I am 100% in support of trans people. People should be able to be whatever gender they want. They should make love to whoever they want or not be asexual. Rock on is my position. I could not disagree more with Ben Shapiro's thing that like you have to taunt trans people. It's low. It's disgusting. Trans people get murdered in the streets. So like literally F you Ben Shapiro for dunking on trans people who are just marginalized and hurt and endanger their whole lives. And it can't be easy to go through that experience. My heart goes out to them. Putting that aside, people have tried to cancel Ben Shapiro for his feelings on, you know, as a, as a very devout uh, religious person, his feelings on premarital sex, et cetera, et cetera, homosexuality, or how he feels about trans people. What do you think of this? And you're an agency. So how do you how on earth do you deal with whether it's, you know, uh, Ben Shapiro on one side, or maybe on the other side, you have, you know, Joe Rogan having Alex Jones on who, you know, said the uh, people from Sandy Hook was a false flag and that those children those poor parents whose children were murdered, that that was done for political reasons and was like the fake space moon landing. How do you deal with this and how do you mitigate it? And is this an acute issue now in podcasting? It's getting a lot more difficult when you have opinion-driven content, right? And I think we're seeing the studies. The country is more polarized than it's ever been. People are less proud of being American. You know, we're, we're the United States and we've never been less united in uh in our thinking everything seems to become a, a political issue right whatever it is the world got sick it's a it's democrats versus republicans somehow right and um and so this is something i'm very very focused on and actually launching a podcast called oxford road presents the divided states of media because brands don't know what to do they want to do right they want to support causes that align with their values and and they've got a business to run and I don't know that it helps anyone for them to be partisan. You know, do you do you really need cores to be a Republican or Democrat supporting company? And is that even good for be, society? Right? I just need it to be ice cold and right, it's made exactly. in the Rockies. Exactly right. And, and <laughs> the so, worst that ever. So, by the way, <laughs> I, I need uh, to be ice cold. <laughs> So listen, you know, Shapiro's one that comes up a lot. And look, I, I know Ben Shapiro, and I and I think that what's he like? What's that kid like? I think he's a decent guy. I really like him. I, and I think that I, I don't agree with everything that he thinks or says or how he says it. But I also think that most people's understanding of Ben Shapiro is based on what they heard somebody said that he thinks. And 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 what my problem is with advertisers is that we don't have due process right now. We have somebody said something on Twitter. It's blowing up. Now Media Matters is threatening me or Sleeping Giants. And it's a reaction. Everything is a nature creator. Sleeping Giants is a partisan group fo really focused on Twitter that just that just harasses sponsors. They're all about Fox News. They're really focused on Fox. And it's like they're saying it, basically the assumption oh, is. Oh, I got you. They're the ones who are going after what's his name? Who's the star the, guy? Uh, uh, t t Tucker Carlson. But, but the reality is. And it'll be somebody else after Tucker Carlson. They usually go after who's on top. But the point is, it's not about going after Tucker Carlson. What they're doing is they're going after the sponsors and they're doing yeah. all this if then logic. Because you allow your ad to run adjacent to this content, then you must hold these views based on this soundbite or else we're going to shame you off the platform. And it puts a lot of pressure on it. And people are not thinking rationally. How about you call Ben Shapiro or call his company if you are a sponsor and go, now people are saying that you have some very um, insensitive, problematic. <laughs> problematic, hateful, it, it, whatever the accusation is, give the guy a chance to defend himself. And who knows, maybe he'll rethink the things that he's saying or the way that he's thinking about them if you actually have a conversation with him. But the problem with the knee-jerk reactions is there is no conversation. And so everybody gets further and further split apart. And I don't think it's good for brands because if you can't, the things that drive your business, whether it's Facebook or talk radio or uh, or, or certain podcasts that, that or 
Fox News or things that truly can keep the lights on for your business and keep your employees employed, you want to we need to slow down a little bit and really take things in context and have a conversation I'd before laugh. we just, you know, there should be a yeah. process. There should I be a process. Sit, I could sit down with Ben Shapiro, honestly, or maybe I'll have him on my podcast or I'll call on his. Maybe Nick would set that up. I could sit that kid down and I could explain to him why he needs to not change his position on certain issues like trans people, but why he has to take a different approach. Because when you're as influential as he is, when you talk about whether it's, you know, radicalization of certain religions or trans people, you have to take into the effect that whatever percentage of people in your audience, I always think about this, the people suffering from severe mental illness in your audience is 1%, 2%. I'm not talking about depression or, you know, anxiety. Well, we all got that right now in the pandemic. But I'm talking about people who are, you know, could do something dangerous in the world. Right. It's 1%, right? Or it's 0.1%. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now you get into the law of big numbers. You got 300,000 followers, 300,000 downloads. You got a million downloads. You got 3 million downloads. You do have to take into account as a media personality that if you were to say something insensitive about trans people that one of those people could take it and double it and triple it so you want to pull back those things and explain them and contextualize them so that those people do not become victims it's something i've learned because i was always very i don't know opinionated kid from brooklyn and i and i and i changed the way i phrase things as my profile increased mm -hmm. because i don't want anybody to be hurt by what i'm saying i used to use the word retard where that's retarded when I was on the early days of the podcast and I grew up I and I didn't know that word was, you know, I'm talking about 12 years ago. And then somebody who's very close to me, I'm talking about like one of my 20 best friends said to me, I've never told you this, like a poker buddy. I, my brother suffers from mental, he's mentally, you know, challenged. He's the R word. And when I hear you say it on your podcast, it really hurts me. And, I, and then I used to say, I had a catchphrase in the early days of the podcast. I just say, I'll kill yourself. Like when somebody would be like, do something really bad, I would just say, oh, that person just kill themselves. Like really like you're a horrible human being. I like I would say it about somebody who was a murderer or whatever. And then a, a kid emailed me. He said, my dad, Jason, I'm one of your biggest fans. This is an email. And I, I get very emotional when I read this, when I think about this email. He said, my dad killed himself. And I listen to your podcast and I just wait for you to say the words, kill yourself. And it just makes me think of my dad. I never said it again. Yeah. I never said it again. And that's when I started to realize, you know, with, with great power comes great responsibility. The Spider-Man line. It's, it's not the, the reason that phrase sticks in people's minds is because it's true. Marco, what do you think is people have the right to protest and the, and the dollars do support these podcasts. But what do you think about this sort of moment we're in right now and how influential these podcasts are getting? I mean, you know, culturally, you know, I'm I'm with you that, you know, I, I have said things in in my younger years that I have later learned were exclusionary or insensitive. And I've whenever I've, you know, realized that or been notified of that, I've I've tried to do the right thing and, and you know, get them out of my vocabulary or, you know, really become a lot more conscious about like what I'm saying and what I'm not saying and et cetera. And I think that's the right approach for, or, you know, for personalities. And then, you know, for the apps uh, and for podcasting, you know. I'm lucky that my app is a 30th the market share of Apple's app. And so if Apple wants to, you know, delist a podcast from their directory, um, they're going to get that's going to be a big impact on somebody and they're going to, you know, they're going to be in the press and it's going to be controversial and everything. Um, and podcast apps are in this weird place where like, you know, like, like if there is something like the Alex Jones uh, podcast that was delisted a couple years back or whatever, whenever that was, um, Podcast apps are kind of like web browsers in the sense that, you know, they can access publicly mm. available content. And so there is a place in most podcast apps where you can add an RSS feed just by URL. So if so you, you know the URL of the feed, you add, can add. You can still add Alex Jones to your iTunes, to your sure. Apple podcast, but Apple's not going to list him in the rankings. Right. And or so, the directory. So the directory is different than... Correct. The URL so, you, you know, in. Meanwhile, I mean, it's very powerful. Most people, again, most people find podcasts to add to their podcast app by searching for them by name in the directory. So if you're not in the directory, you're not going to get many subscribers. But, you know, in, in one level, like podcast apps 
can be relatively neutral. And, you know, in the same way that a web browser shouldn't block you from entering a certain URL if you type it in. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't think it's appropriate for my app to totally ban the playing of a URL if you type it in. However, um, I also, again, like because I have such small market share relative to Apple, I'm just like other people are free to say what they want for the most part. I am free not to promote them if I want. And so right. if there is a podcast out there that has content that I consider either, you know, illegal or hateful or otherwise problematic. Yeah, it's your house. Uh, that I, yeah, I don't, I choose not to promote it in my app. And, now and you know, what about I, and this? I do that with a pretty light hand, like, you know, only yeah. fairly egregious offenses, you know, will get you not promoted in Overcast because frankly, I don't have the resources to go out there and police yeah. everything. I, I'm one person, you know, I don't, I'm one person, I only speak one language and I only have a certain number of hours in the day to work. And so I'm not, I don't make it a point to police the directory myself, but when I get reports of podcasts that have really problematic content, I will, I will remove them from like the promotional areas. So you can still search for them by name, usually, unless they're real bad. Um, but you know, yeah, I'm not somebody's promote, got a white, su- somebody's got a white supremacy podcast. It's going to get dinged and you're going to take it out. Oh yeah. If I hear if of that, somebody, that's, that's gone. Yeah. If somebody told you, Hey, this is the URL for this white supremacy this is like a super edge case, but this is the URL, yeah. you know, klukluxclan.com slash RSS, you know, would you actually block the URL consider? Would you consider that if like, if like people came down on you? I think that would fall into like the, the web browser thing. I don't, yeah. I don't currently have a mechanism to do that. I mean, I could right. build one, um, but that's never really come up because no. again, like that's, that's such an edge case where people are going to actually go add the URL manually. And, you know, typically these, these, you know, hate podcasts have like four listeners. I mean, we're not talking about a lot of right. people here. That's um, one of the reasons I thought like the, I was always taught and I'm of a certain generation, Gen X, uh, the ACLU used to fight to protect the Ku Klux Klan literally marching down main street in cities. And we were taught in college, protect the worst speech so that all speech remains free because you don't want to get into a situation where, People can't say what they want. That that's was we were indoctrinated into this, and now we we're living in this world where people are saying no, 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 no. You, we need to. The, words actually do hurt people. Words have damage associated with them. There is fallout from these words. Um, we need to control the words. And I I don't actually am not smart enough to have an answer for it. But I think Dan, that's what you're going to try to do with this new that's podcast. Our- it, that's our exploration and, and to try to figure out because I'd love to be look, a guest on that. It's well, we'll, we'll book it. Um, cause it's, it's really important. And, you know, brands, I think you look at the business round table and companies are taking a new level of responsibility Explain in what the that society is. around them. Uh, business round table, you know, a uh, hundred or so of the top companies in America all came together and said, here's the purpose of a corporation. It's no longer just about shareholder value. It's about stakeholder value, which includes suppliers, employees, the community around you, right? Customers. Yeah, customers. And and I think to some extent, there's always been there. But but the, the evolution is that brands are getting more political. They are taking a stand on social issues. And I think that customers, that's resonating with them. So, so that's getting rewarded. And that's the reality we live in. But the problem is where, you know, when are you supporting free speech? And when are you supporting hate? Figuring out those lines, trying to figure out what's constructive. And how do you actually truly promote civil discourse from diverse points of view without alienating one side and finding those lines is a very difficult challenge for for companies today and we're going to try to help them navigate that and get perspectives from people like yourself who are working in this ecosystem as we just try to because there's no right answer but i do believe listen let me just say something as 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 the father of a special needs child um your story earlier about this is the answer if there is one because it's redemptive it's beautiful and it was it was corrective um if if it were just somebody blasting you on twitter um and canceling and canceling yeah yeah, right you wouldn't have had that you you wouldn't have evolved in that way you wouldn't have a different level of discourse well and think about how terrible i would feel if i still had that in my vernacular right which by the way was when i grew up in brooklyn that word was second only to the f word yeah. In its usage in Brooklyn, for, and that's from the seventies through the eighties when I, I, I grew I, I, up. I, I've been and, there, and, yeah. and it, 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 I feel so much better about myself 
Yeah. I feel better about myself that I removed it. And anybody, when my friends use it, I take them aside. And I say, have you ever exactly. heard of the have you heard of the R word challenge? And they say, no. I say, go to this website and let me tell you this story. And I say to them, and I was just on a thread with a bunch of my friends, and somebody kept saying, uh, blacklist and whitelist. Mm -hmm. And one of my friends said, listen, I know this is going to sound silly to you, but take whitelist out and call it a banned list, mm -hmm. because what you're saying is white and black. White is good, black is bad. Right. And for people, you may not come up on your radar as a white person. And it might seem silly because the word has been in the vernacular for so long, but we're all trying to evolve as a society and get somewhere right. here. Right. And if that's hurting somebody, even if you, because like a Ben Shapiro would think that was silly and over policing. It's not well, we'll, silly. We'll see if when it's you talk to him, somebody. right? But yeah. but listen, I think the point is, I do think that you know Ben is like a lot of people who are rational actors that don't want to hurt people. Um, and I think that you, you, yeah. you in your case, so. in your example, it wasn't that you got called out or shamed. And some people believe that shame, shame leads to change. I believe that relationship does. And somebody that, that had the, the respect for you to pull you aside, let you protect your dignity and just say, this is hurtful to me. You, that's what caught, that's what made a difference. And, and so oh, it hit you, me. So, I mean, I, I just, cause yeah. then I just spent, I spent a year thinking about all the times we use the R word at the poker mm -hmm. table mm -hmm. for a decade. And he sat there and suffered. And, and, and I just said, oh, I, I didn't want to blame him for not telling us, but you know, society evolves and we all exactly. need to evolve and, and like create a little bit of space and for a conversation. That's exactly. why I think podcasts are so great. I love podcasting. Right. Yeah. All right, listen, I took you guys for 75 minutes. This has been amazing. We got to do it again in six months or so or a year. Uh, two great guests. I've been really wanting to have Marco on for a long time just because I love having product people and man in terms of product people uh you, know, you don't get to meet uh or recognize who makes the greatest products in the world all that often but you know there's elon musk there was steve jobs uh johnny ive um you know at com.com alex too i believe and really marco your products have always just been some of the most beautiful products made on it and uh you, you don't raise venture capital you just Thank build you, pro you just yeah. build products and, and they really make money. what it is like i like i like working alone I, i'm not a good manager of people <laughs> i like working at home and my hat like i have my family life so I, I i do what i can as what as a one person company yeah my friend phil kaplan does that too he uh, i don't know if you know him from he did the fuck company thing then he did ad bright and then uh, now he's doing disto distro kid and he's kind of like you this like i'm gonna build one company and i maybe have some support people over here that i do but it's like these solo developer product geniuses. Uh, it's just great to have you on the podcast, finally. Uh, thanks for coming, Marco. Uh, Thank you so it. much. Follow Marco Arment at A-R-M-A-R-C-O-A-R-M-E-N-T and Marco.org. Uh, Dan, really appreciate uh, that you were uh, doing This Week in Marketing back in the day. You called out the Ashley Madison CEO <laughs> presciently. I know, you got to give you credit for that. We're going to pull that clip. Um, and uh, congratulations on getting into podcasting early uh, with Oxford Road. If you're looking to spend money on podcasting and do it wisely, you need to uh, email Dan at OxfordRoad.com, right? Is that the, your email? You can email me. That's fine. For your yeah. audience, yes. No email no Dan at OxfordRoad.com. He'll walk you through <laughs> Or go it. to Oxford Road guy and sign up for our newsletter, The Influencer, and our new podcast, there Divided States of Media. I love it. I love it. All right. Uh, thanks, guys, for coming on the pod, Dan and Marco. Thank you. And we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye.